It is episode 152 to recap Super Bowl number 52. What happened in that Super Bowl? We're going to get to that, Josh. We're I definitely going to get to that. Uh, I'm going to tell you what. I am going to save my emotional Eagles rant for the end of the show. Cool. Good. Um, I mean, if you cry, I'm just going to fucking... Oh, he's got I'm going to... Please, social, get ready. Film. The reason <laughs> we're doing it at the end is because there's a 95% chance team. I'm going to cry. And I won't get through the rest of the show <laughs> if he's I already, do it first. He's already oh, he's he's up. Up. Look at him. It's been bad. It's been really bad. That's all right. So allowed to, you're allowed to cry. Oh, man. I mean, all right. So let's start off. Hey, everybody. I actually want to start with the rant. I kind of want to. I want to see him disheveled the for the whole yeah. rest of the show. We cannot ruin the flow. What we are here for is I believe we are the coolest and smartest football show there is. And we're going to give them the X's and O's breakdown from Sims. And, of course, my emotional blabbering that will happen. Yep. But we need to start off. It's 52. Best 52s. Josh, I do you got have nothing any from Rutgers. I will turn to Chris Sims. Well, I mean, we know 52 Ray Lewis. Yes. Yep. Congratulations on Hall of Fame. Yes. Should have been first first ballot all the way. Look at that. Little graphics. Uh, fit, yep. I mean, hey, this is it's him, Lawrence Taylor, Dick Buckus, right? What's Greatest. pretty incredible is the other 52, right. Robert Brazil, also got into the Hall of Fame this weekend. Linebacker known as Dr. Doom from the Oilers. Right, Dr. Doom. <laughs> it's it's an amazing Hall of Fame class. Let me rip through the other 52s. Two 52s in the game. Alandon Roberts, Roberts right? and Najee Good. Khalil Mack, Alec Ogletree, yep. also 52s. Right. Patrick Willis, Clay Matthews. Oh, I would have forgot those. Pepper Johnson, my dad's old middle linebacker. Legendary center Mike Webster Ooh, was a 52 one. from the right, Steelers. Right. And I want to give a personal shout out to Dan Neal. Dan Neal was 11 seasons with the Colts and Bears. He coached for 15 years. He's the only person to play for and coach under Mike Ditka. He is a friend of mine. He just went through surgery, so I hope he's doing well. Shout out to his daughter Tiffany, who actually called me right as the Super Bowl ended, and I just decided to do a FaceTime. So I love the Neal family, and I'm so happy I get to bring them up. But the Hall of Fame class, yes. Ray Lewis and Brazil, who I just said, Erlacher, Moss, Owens, Jerry Kramer, Bobby Bethard, and the best safety that ever lived, Brian Dawkins. You know Dan Neal? Yeah. Dan Neal, I mean, he went to Texas. He's a Texas guy. No, he went to Kentucky. Oh, you're talking about older Dan Neal. Yes, older Dan Neal. Okay. Yeah, not young gotcha. Dan Neal. Right, okay. Yeah, okay. The fact that the Eagles win the Super wait, Bowl wait, hold on. the same weekend oh. that Brian Dawkins gets okay. in the Hall of Good. Fame right. is insane to me. Right. Uh, Are we I, going to Canton? I'm 100% going to Canton. And Bleacher, yeah. we're going. Uh, I'm going. <laughs> A little road trip? <laughs> I don't know about that. We'll decide. We're that going to go. We're yeah, going to we'll convince Sims, just like we convinced him to do the podcast. Uh, I thought uh, it was a lot of big names for the class. Erlacher and Ray Lewis, the two middle linebackers for their generation. Yep. Moss and Owens, the two wide receivers for their generation. Yep. You have a bone to pick with it, though, huh? Well, I, I, I do have a bone to pick with it. I mean, first of all, I heard a few people saying, like, the whole, like, I don't know if Brian Dawkins should have got in right away or so quickly. Yes, he should have. Brian Dawkins is definitely in the arg in the conversation for one of the ten greatest safeties in the history of the sport, for my opinion. There's now, just not a lot of safeties that have gotten. No, in. there's not. I've heard people like say like a few times, well, you know, first, second year, you know, getting into the Hall of Fame. That's for like Ronnie Lott, and I want to be. I I've had it. I said it to Stagat today. Brian Dawkins is in the conversation with Ronnie Lott. Right. I mean, he's he's that kind of player. So don't be enamored because you were younger exactly. back in those days. Time makes things seem right. more impressive. You know, so that. Um, the other thing I would say, and it's not a total bone to pick, but it's just it was surprising to me. I do not think Brian Urlacher is you a— You said that beforehand. Yes, he is not a first ballot Hall of Famer. He's a Hall of Famer without a doubt. But first ballot Hall of Famers belong to people like Ray Lewis or Randy Moss. Or Terrell Owens. I mean, he deserved to be as well. Yeah. But Jerry Rice, arguably the people that you say, you could say they're the greatest at their position all time. Right. But without a doubt are top three greatest of all time. And Because Erlacher has been run over a few times in his career. Certainly. I, I mean, there was a period. Also, in, there was a lot of offensive linemen that didn't get the call that you could have argued could get in over Erlacher, Baselli. Agreed. Uh, Walter, I mean, I don't think Walter Jones. Hutchinson. Hutchinson. Uh, Fanica. Fanica yeah. I mean, Tony. Yeah, we said Baselli. Uh, there's even, you know, J Joe Jacoby. Any of those I would have been. Yeah. So Erlacher, a Hall of Famer. Again, I'm not trying to hate on Brian Erlacher. Uh, but I would also say, man, when I played against them in like 2005 and some of those games, you know, Erlocker was awesome. Don't get me wrong again. But, man, I mean, 55 Lance, Lance Briggs, Briggs, the other guy. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm not going to lie. In 2005 when we played them, we were we were more worried about Lance Briggs than we were yeah. Brian Erlocker. 
Uh, we usually do our Second Amendment, which is Kyle Shanahan, and I have something for it. Kyle Shanahan's, Shanahan's our, our favorite, favorite coach, coach in the NFL. He was at the Super Bowl. I just got to wave to him from a distance. Nice. You didn't get to talk to him? I didn't get to talk to him. I mean, you know, he wanted me to, like, every night I got a text message, like, come out, come party with me, blah, 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 blah. Let's have a drink. I haven't seen you. And I was like, I, I got I a show at 4.50 in, in the morning. I uh, saw Sims's wife after the Super Bowl, and he goes, she goes, Chris told me to bring all of my stuff to go out all the nights, and he just goes to sleep at, like, 9. Yep. I was like, you're dating, right. you're married to an 85-year-old man. <laughs> yep, there he is. <laughs> uh, but here's the Kyle Shanahan thing. Colts and Lions fans, I think, should be thrilled. Kyle lost the Super Bowl, went to San Francisco, and I think it gave him even more juice. Right. Patricia, Detroit, yep. McDaniels, Indianapolis. Right. I mean, they're going to be so, they're already going to be motivated to prove it, but there's no glowing. It's going to be about how do you build off of that loss? How yes. do you, I think it's good for those teams. I always have. Yeah. I and agree. I believe that coaches that have gone on to get head coaching job before the Super Bowl are winless in the Super Bowl. Uh, I, I, I saw I think, that stat. I think, yes. I think you're right. I, I, you know, the thing, um, the other thing, too, I mean, I've heard a lot of people go, oh, well, how does Detroit feel about, you know, he's the head coach now after they gave up all points. those yards. Uh, well, listen, we'll get into that when we get into the football. I'm not even going to say it right now. We're we'll gonna wait till we break game. down the game. Yeah, so I want to give first a shout-out to all of the incredible fan support at Radio Row. Absolutely. We had people driving five hours, people coming all over the place, messaging us all the time, saying how great the content was. Mitchell Neeson, our guy from Iowa, yeah. who drove up an Iowa football scouting packet to hand-deliver to Lefko. <laughs> yes. And the Grunmeyers, who were yes. doing the Bortles on the first day of Radio Row. It was awesome. hilarious. We had, hilarious. We had a bunch of people. It was awesome. The Wisconsin duo who came yes that you and met and took the picture with right right yeah. but Those fuckers. instagram youtube itunes twitter it really was incredible i thought we had awesome stuff you know flutie talking about the concerts bradshaw the heart attack uh camaro was the, the coolest guy i met i saw him at a club later that night and he was like dap me up right you guys have not seen the emmett smith interview where he legitimately gets mad but i saw him later and we made up and then he got to see Migos, and Migos was like, em they have a song like Emmett Smith, Emmett Smith, Emmett Smith, and he pointed at me during, so me and him have mended the fences. Good, good. He legitimately got angry Yes, at me. he did. He was hot. I mean, but, yeah, you could tell he was offended from years of yes. Eagles fandom. So that will be the next few weeks will be great content. We're going to mix up those interviews and bring them to, we still have like 20 more yeah. interviews to bring you anyway, guys. Yeah, 25. Uh, I am going to do again. My Eagles reaction at the end of the show, because I cannot do it now, because I'm probably going to cry, and Sims is going to just make fun of me. The one thing I will say is that if any of y'all want to come over and kick it, I have a lot of space right now in Goskowski's head. You can move oh, in. Oh, baby. Because I don't know, baby. I know it was wide left, but it was wide something. It was wide something. <laughs> it was wide something. So come on, pull up a chair. I got space. We live in here now. There were so many people during the game tweeting at Lefko and at our account of just like, I can't believe it. Lefko put the hex on Steven Goskowski. The mush. And here we are. The, the mush. mush. The mush. It, it's honestly, it's the ultimate redemption for you. This you whole spent the game, whole season yes. being the mush. And now here you are. You nailed it in the only one that mattered. All right, so before we get to the emotion, we're going to do a few things. Uh, Malcolm Butler, what the fuck happened there? Uh, how do you trade Nick Foles at this point? And we're going to do a deep dive into Sims' film breakdown. I have all of his notes. But I, I, let's say this. The Philly celebration, yeah. I don't think it was that crazy. No. Uh, I know people are, are shocked by the guy eating dog poop. Don't forget. I, I didn't see that one. Ugh. I did see the Ritz-Carlton thing poop. collapse, though. That was awesome. Cavaliers fans ate horse poop first so oh. we didn't start that trend what the fuck are you the, people the doing on, the awning i've always wanted to jump on an awning i, I understand cool. why Who it doesn't? broke yeah the every cartoon that i've ever seen you off. bounce off of it the one guy that just did the old backdrop like fall uh -oh. off that was cool but then i guess they all thought they could do that uh, i will say this the eagles thing i I was expecting them to start fires and flip over cars. <laughs> I was a little disappointed. Bad. I was expecting yes. more. And that's what I, I wanted. wanted more. I wanted it to be a little disappointed. Yeah, I was a little disappointed. And uh, But the one thing I did notice when I was watching is like, like legit fireworks in the middle of people who were oh. like <laughs> right there. Like how did nobody catch on fire? A few times it was looked like they were legit commercial. <laughs> yeah. And like people were just like, get out of the way. <laughs> Man, my yeah. friend Brianna, her brother, got up on a street pole and did 10 pull-ups. I love it. And they oh, were just counting idea. them out. Oh, that's that awesome. so cool. I'm really happy for Philadelphia. I, I appreciate really that. Yes. Uh, how did you watch the game? 
Like you, you were on the I field. I was on the field. I got kicked off the field. So, so I was just what? gonna get that. Yes, I didn't realize my pass for my. I was on the field all pregame. Yeah, because you were bragging all week. Oh, my pass! I could watch on the field. I did. And then, so I got. So I was all pregame, and I had a great time at pregame. Got to catch up with a lot of coaches and friends, and talk to players, and you know, saw Bradley Cooper with his girlfriend over on the Eagles. Did you side say line. anything smart? No, I did not. I just admired his girlfriend. Really, I was like, damn, she's pretty. What's her name? Uh, uh, she's know. a model actress girl. You're going to know. She's like, <laughs> so the game starts and one of the head NFL security guys comes over and he, he goes, are you supposed to, or, I don't think you're supposed to be on there. And he looked up at my face. He goes, Oh, Hey Chris, how you doing? Uh, you're okay. Damn. Okay. okay yeah. You're okay. And he walks away. Now I think he might've tattletailed on me like a few seconds and into his mic. One of the underlings. Right. right. Yeah. But, uh, so a few seconds, about a minute go by. And your Eagles are driving a little, and they get a first down. All of a sudden, I have a woman come to me, and she's like, hey, you got to get out of here. You're not supposed to be on here. <laughs> and to get on the field, you had to scan in and out off really? the field. That's how high-tech crap it got. Right. So you had to scan in and scan out. They're like, you got to get out of here. And I was holding a Coca-Cola in my hand. Ooh. And they're like, and you're not allowed to have that on the sideline because it was the Pepsi right, Super Bowl. Right, you're supposed to put it in like a nameless cup. So he's like, and she got the wrong drink. And I was like, okay, I'm oh, sorry. All right, I'll get out of the way. So, so where'd you go? The first drive, I just watched. I, I was in the end zone where they threw the ball in the yes. back of the end zone on the first drive before they kicked the field goal, yes. right? Uh, so then I went to the NBC green room. I watched really from there on out. I watched the game on TV. Yeah. And just a normal telecast. And of course, could I got. Could you hear the stadium? I could hear the stadium. Was the stadium early? The stadium, uh, no. You know, for the most part, I couldn't hear it enough to. That be, no, we were on the exact feed. Gotcha. The exact I would imagine feed. You're so there that, with NBC. That helped me, right? So I did that. But then came halftime, and I was like, I looked at my pass, and I was like, I'm allowed to be on the field at halftime. I'm going to see JT. And I started to go out, and I'm like, they blocking us out because the whole halftime just going at the up. tunnel yeah. I'm supposed to go out to. So the tunnel I've been going to, I can't get to. So I say, fuck it. I'm turning around, and I'm going to go through the tunnel. I just saw the Eagles go out at halftime on the side of the stadium. Man. And I ran through there, and as I'm running through there, Justin Timberlake started the show inside there, the little club area. Where you were. <laughs> inside. Because he came, before he walked on this, if you remember, yeah, he was in the club and he went up the stairs. Right, so I was like right there, and I was like, "Holy shit!" Wait, he's right here. So I was like, "This is awesome." And then he went out, and Hi, I, Mom. I ran outside when he went outside, and I'm sitting there, and I got a video, and I'm filming it because I'm going to show my kids. And literally, all of a sudden, the girls and everybody that's going to mosh pit, they were like coming by me. And I'm like, "Holy shit! I got to get out of the way." <laughs> Backed out of the way, but yes, I watched the uh, halftime show from on the field, which was really cool. Man, and then did yeah. you stay out there for the third quarter? And no, so you got I off? was like, you know what? I'm not even going to mess with this. So then yeah. I walked back that same tunnel and saw a few of your Eagles coaches, and they were just coming out of the side. Yeah. You know, and I just kind of gave them five, and that was, and went back and watched TV. Fourth quarter, I had to watch from the NBC Sports set. Where I got to listen to the telecast, Which is but nice. I was watching live, right? Yeah, because I was watching in the stadium, and I didn't know Malcolm Butler right. wasn't like playing until you, you right? texted me. Right? Where? What was your setup, Joshy? Uh, I was at a bar for the first half of the game, and then I was on my couch for the second half of the game. Okay. So I, yeah, I'm so jealous. I, first yeah, half, right? <laughs> first half, I watched with friends, but then I knew when the game, when it got down to business, that I wanted to be. You know, yeah, right. quiet. I was. I had the big plate of chicken wings. Oh, good. Like, oh, of really oh good. Yeah, good. Just good. Munching them down. I had an awesome situation where right behind me was a wall, and then it was the club boxes. And Steve oh. Tish and was Steve sitting behind Tish you. Steve Tish was sitting behind me and talking to my mom almost the whole game. <laughs> wow. Not like that. Oh. But like there was one part where it was like the replay, and Steve Tish hey, Sharon, leans in, Sharon. and he goes, he goes, listen. I don't even like you guys, but that was a touchdown. And I'm like, hey, Steve Tish, show of the Giants. Thanks so much. Russell Wilson and Sierra were there. Cool. I was like on my eighth Jack and Coke, or Captain and Coke. And you I was know, like, Lefko did the Instagram story on Bleacher Report for the whole game. So I, he, I mean, I knew he was, yes. He, you were not drinking in any of the shots, though. Which, yeah, I mean, I was drinking. What a professional. In between, yeah. <laughs> well, I very well. I was expecting you to be like downing beers oh, I was. on camera. It was Captain and Cokes. <laughs> yeah. Probably spent like three hundred dollars on drinks. Great. I bet. Uh, but yeah, Russ and Sierra. I was like, Russ, I'm with Bleacher Report. Do you want to come on? He was like, No. I was nah. like, You're great. <laughs> He's like, No. You guys are so politically incorrect, and you cuss too much. I'm never coming on. <laughs> um, uh, a lot of people have been saying this. Is this the best Super Bowl of all time? I'm just going to read a few facts, and mm -hmm. you tell me. Uh, it is the most yards in any game, not just Super Bowl, most right. yards in any game. Right. In terms of the points, you see 74 total points right there. 
It's actually second most in points, only behind the Niners and Chargers one that was a blowout. 49 26. So it's the most points and yards in a competitive Super Bowl. Right. The other ones that came to my mind 51, Patriots, Falcons. 49, Patriots, Seahawks. 34, Rams, Titans. Sure. 23, Niners, Bengals. Yeah. Am I missing any? To me, uh, 32. Uh, is that Washington, Denver? No, 32 is Green Bay. Denver. Denver. Elway versus Favre. Great Super Bowl. That was a great Super Bowl. I didn't Rams, s- Patriots, the first, you know, that first 2000, one. Yeah. Right, because the the Rams were such a favorite, and that was Brady's first Super Bowl. That was pretty awesome to yeah. my So it's in that conversation. It, I don't think it's my favorite. I legitimately but. did not sit one time. I think when you also factor in the Patriots never punted yes. and the Eagles punted once, Look, there's a lot of people that are going to go, yeah, but what about defense? Well, guess what? If it was 10-9, to they'd be saying, what about offense? So I just thought the execution of both offenses, we saw two quarterbacks performing at a super high level, and I don't think there was ever a down low moment. No, Every single drive was – I felt every play – the game was on the line. I agree. If the Eagles didn't get this first down, right. it was over. If right. the Patriots didn't get a first down, it was over. Agreed. I, in terms of excitement level, I think it was it's peak the whole game. Top, it was. It was. There was no lulls. I'll give you that. You're right. I think from top peakness, it yeah. was. And never a big letdown. It was letdown. a wire-to-wire exciting I game. I still would take 49. I mean, uh, Super Bowl 49, I think, over Seahawks, it. Patriots. Yeah, just You're because. You're coming in with the former NF, uh, NFL champion Seahawks. It's the it's the it's maybe the new dynasty right. versus the old dynasty. It's Wilson. It's Brady. That Patriots team was talented, unlike this one, which I don't think was very talented. This, though, the storylines so. of all the craziness with the Eagles, with the ending of the dynasty, with the Patriots, with their coaches leaving and right. all that stuff. Right. and what Malcolm that mean. Butler, all that crap. Um, you were on TV a lot. I saw you doing an RPO example. Yes. Uh, you had a long week, 5 a.m. wake-ups. Fuck Post-game man. show, I try and go find Sims, and I want to get behind him, and they got like these walls, right? And I'm trying to see him, and I go, hey, you see that, that blonde motherfucker? I do a show with him. I just want to mess with him. They go, don't bother him. He's working. And I look at the guy. I go, no, no, no. no, no if no. I bother him, it's going to make him better. <laughs> you need to trust me. Have you watched the tape of the post game yet? Mm-mm. When they cut to you guys on NBC Sports Net, uh, Sports Network, Chris was like a bat out of hell, just talking like oh, miles back and miles to like and three years ago. Yes, Team just, now he that he is. couldn't get it all out fast enough. I it couldn't. Was I was so, so pumped. You were so I was. excited. I had so many things. I had a note card of all the things I'd written down during the game. I had so many storylines, and you know, of course, this is what ruined it. And this actually it, it annoyed me too. And, and of course, it's you know we're in Johnny Media world now too. Johnny Media. Gronkowski's Johnny Media. comment after the game, right about right, retirement, which Florio was the one that really put it out there, and I'll give him credit for that. He really was. And he had found somebody that found that was a real thing, and he tweeted something out about it during mm-hmm. the game. And Gronk's answer, which was funny, was I don't even know how you heard about that, which was basically saying yes, that's kind of true. Interesting. But that took over our post game. To the fact where it took over more than the Malcolm Butler story, which That's I annoying. was, and they were like, "Well, no, this is the greatest tight end ever." And I wanted to be like, "Yes, but we can talk the whole off season about that." Exactly. This game was affected like dramatically because one of the best corners in the game was not playing. It's been really weird to hear uh, analysts, right. people that talk bloviators, say that Malcolm Butler wasn't that great. Crazy, I'm sitting there erroneous. Going, we're we're going to talk about that second. Erroneous. I, I want to talk On about all accounts. the TV broadcast really quickly because I haven't watched it. I only watched the last quarter and a half in the airport bar while I was drinking rosés because I was just sitting there going, oh, this is another Nick Foles completion to Ertz. <laughs> My g- setting the bar. Talk about it. Yeah. Are we doing setting the bar? No, 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 of course. But I'm just, I'm curious. I've heard a lot of talks, and Fendrick, I need you here. Al Michaels, Chris Collinsworth, what is the talk right now from people about the broadcast? Because I heard it wasn't that great. Yeah, so the big thing that I took away from the broadcast that I was just saying to Chris before was that because the most important play of the game, or arguably the most important play, the Earth's touchdown, they had no idea. Like, they were going back and forth, catch, no catch, we don't know what this is, and you could tell when he caught it that Al didn't call it the way that he wanted to Mm. because he was nervous. Like, it seemed like he was almost nervous to call it the right way. Right. So, to me, I just left the game feeling like there were so many moments, the the Brady fumble, the Clement catch, like all these moments that 
were questionable, and that's just you know kind of luck of the draw. I think it's funny that all year we go, no one knows what a catch is, but then people are upset at Collinsworth because he got it wrong. Yeah, you know what I mean? Like right, all year right. you've been saying no one knows, and you're like, how do you not know? Yeah, uh, because nobody knows. So it kind of just left me with a funny feeling that I felt like they didn't nail the biggest moments because there's no way to nail a moment that you can't assess right. in, in real time. Yeah, I, Collinsworth and Al are awesome. There's no doubt. They're, they're my two favorites. Well, they're, they're, yeah. I, I totally agree. I mean, Doesn't mean you can't have an off night. Exactly, guy. exactly right. Yeah. Did I think? Yes, I, I'm with you. I mean, it wasn't some of their best stuff ever. Like usually, Collinsworth is all over that, oh. makes a definitive comment. It's the big stage too, and I'll also give them this. You know, they're, they didn't do anything AFC Championship weekend. Just like anything else, they've gone a few weeks without having a few reps. Right. So I, I thought about that as I was watching the game. I will say this: um, watching it live, and I had a few Patriots fans like tell me I was. Uh, the R word. I'm not going to say it. They told me I was mentally disabled, okay? Uh, because they were looking up to the NBC booth to know. And I was like, uh, and, and there was Eagle fans and Patriot fans, but I was like, no, that this is a catch. This is, and they're like, what about Jesse James? Jesse James was catching the ball in the process of going to the ground. This was different. This was a catch. And it was a one step, a two step, a third step leap break for the, the end zone, break the plane, and not enough evidence to really see if the ball actually even hit the ground because it popped up in the air. It might have been a hand underneath it. And and then he still caught it. The so there Ertz were too one, many things. The Ertz one was undoubtedly a catch. Right. I will say this right now. The Corey Clement. Corey Clement was not a catch. It was very close. And I can say that. But here's what happened. Yeah. Because Al Riveron was called out so many times during the regular season, right. I believe that in the playoffs, divisional championship, and Super Bowl, he did not overturn any of those calls that he overturned this season. That was picture-perfect Austin Safari and Jenkins. It was the same thing. It was a catch with one foot with a slight shift to the other that Al Riveron said was not a catch. But I believe because of the public outcry that he was ruining games, he swallowed his whistle. He did in the Jaguars game against the Bills. There was a very similar one where the ball shifted and he ate it. Right. And well, I believe that that outcry gave Corey Clement a touchdown. I think so too. Again, we're seeing the fucking replays at a hundred times slower than real time. And I, I don't even know. I don't think I really agree with you there. I don't. I, I think it was very close to a catch still. We're all confused, too. The ball is allowed to move. Yeah. Did he lose control of it? Yes, it moved. I understand. But even when it moved, he had it pinned against his body. Yeah. So I don't I know. I guess I was saying it wouldn't have been a catch in I week seven. Yeah, I probably not. You're right. They would. They did not have the, but, the kahunas. But, but everyone that, says, you know, that's how we want it called. And I agree. And, it, look, if it's against your team, it's never going to be perfect. Call. Right. Never um, going to be perfect. Also, apparently the internet went wild over Selfie Kid, which I'm super happy that uh, I yeah, missed. Yeah, Timberlake. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. Uh, but I do know that more impressive than Selfie Kid was the fact that first down Fred X, Freddie Mitchell, was behind Timberlake with two phones in the same shot. And everyone's focused on Brace Face, who's like, look, I got a selfie. And I really want to be like, you represent everything that's wrong right now. You're next to Timberlake, and you're like, oh, I got to put... Got to put in my code two three eight seven, and then I got Freddie Mitchell with two phones. Like, Ugh. is that what it looked like? Is that? I mean, that's. Oh, it was like Snapchat was his top priority. Yeah, yeah it was it's, it's unreal. My top priority though was trying to figure out if you want to. Can you stay? Yeah, I'm or out. You, no, I'm gone. Well, okay. I'll, I'll stay for this. Go ahead. Your top priority, and then I'm out. Well, no, I was. You're not gonna no, stay for Lefko I'm gonna crying. Talk about Malcolm Butler. I'll come back. Crying that. Lefko meme. I'll come. Back. All right, then I'll see you in a little bit. <laughs> Good. No, I want to. No, wanna I'm going to talk about Malcolm Butler okay. now. Sims, it's been hey, great. Hey, great. I'll see you guys soon. Way so to this go. is Stay Fendrick in. doing work. Good. What time are we? Is this podcast going to go till like seven? Probably. Okay. It better so I'll, not. I'll come back for the end. See of you, it. Johnny Spreadsheet. Yep, I'll see you. See you. Um, I'll do this off camera. I'm going to get on my spreadsheet and put uh, <laughs> MC equals square. Is that what you think I do all day? Uh, What's amazing is Sims just took E equals MC squared and turned it. into MC squared. Yes. Uh, I had no idea Malcolm Butler was out until Sims texted me after the game. He said they gave up on me. Fuck! It is what it is. You said that you have a good idea of what happened. My first thought. This was my first thought. Malcolm Butler was about to get traded to the Saints this offseason. Mm -hmm. Malcolm Butler has had issues with Bill Belichick for a very long time. Sure. He's a free agent. Sometimes I think Bill Belichick can be so stubborn where he goes, I'm going to win this game without Malcolm Butler, and then when it comes to contract negotiations, I can get him on the cheap. That was the first thing that I thought about. I don't disagree with what you're th – okay. I, I think that is part of the puzzle. 
a little bit. Yes, he's probably frustrated that Malcolm Butler has not agreed to terms maybe they've offered or I mean all of it. And, and before it. you a, go, he's a stubborn guy. There's I just no got doubt. alert for the bleach the BR app that says Malcolm Butler refutes hurtful reports of missed curfew and ridiculous activities that led to Super Bowl benching. This is going to eventually come out. Right. He is going to be a free agent. I didn't and he hear missed curfew. About. I didn't hear missed curfew. I'll tell you what I've so heard. Let's hear what and you've I heard. don't know this a hundred percent. But of course he was sick. Okay, uh, he was sick. He got there a day late. I don't think he practiced well. I think that was the other issue. Now, the two other things I've heard is that he had a girl in the hotel when he wasn't supposed to at one time and that maybe there was some smoking of weed in the hotel room. Damn, right. You've heard this. This is what I've heard. And I can't. And this is just allegedly OK out there before any lawyers call me. Allegedly, this is what happened. Well, This is going to become a report. Uh, but that was just the, that's the that's word on the street. Right yes. And and I actually asked I, I asked a few people that this is obviously this has been reported a little bit okay. already. I think Fox Sports, I heard, has okay. reported someone similar. And Ian Rappaport, I read something today, which was along the same lines as well. Now, we're the really the conversation is, do you commend Belichick for drawing that line in the sand? Or do you say, damn, he cost his team and 52 other players the Super Bowl because of doing this? And I think my, old Bill Belichick, yeah. I don't think, I mean, listen, a lot of weed smoking goes on in every NFL hotel room, any, every NFL hotel. Yeah. Period. It's, so you have control of the floors, and unless some way some staff of the hotel finds out. But I could tell you I've known a lot of stories through the years of big name, big name players where sure. they stunk up the room and the coach had to go cover up for them with security Is or whatever else. Is it normal else. for Belichick to suspend a guy like that? Well, I mean, we know he's, again, one of the biggest rule followers I've ever known. Yeah. And I feel like he's gotten more strict as he's gotten older. Um, I mean, he, this is the same guy that coached Lawrence Taylor, right? Right. Right. So, I mean, I think Lawrence was doing a few worse things than that back in the day. Uh, I think if you went back to his early Patriot teams and some of those guys on those teams, they were no choir boys either. Which guys? I'm not going to say. Shut oh, up. I, no, I no. just told him who the party well, is. I just, I, I just, the, you know, there's renegades on every yes. team. It's unstoppable. So you I don't know what happened. Teams. And again, like I said, I don't know that about Malcolm Butler. But I've talked to people who – are somewhat familiar with their football team. Yeah. And yes, I mean, that's that's the word I got. I look at it both ways. I, I look at it and go, man, Belichick is sticking by the rules. Right. I go, Butler, man, if you actually did those things, then you really did put yourself at risk and you did hurt the team. And then I look at it and go, man, you, you sit him for the whole game. Well, just... It was clearly an issue. We're going to get into the, okay. to the game later. Yeah, okay. uh, the other question I have with the Patriots with them losing is, how much longer will the Patriots be the Patriots? Patricia goes to Detroit. McDaniels goes to Indianapolis. Mm -hmm. Garoppolo is now gone. Belichick is now 65. Yep. 13 coaches in the history of the NFL have coached past 65. His mentor... Bill Parcells retired at 65. Right. Replacing McDaniels, it looks like it's going to be Chad O'Shea as the favorite. The defensive coordinator, Shiano, is being rumored. Maybe it's Flores. I'm just curious. Every year, right now, the Patriots are the favorite to win the Super Bowl next sure, year. Sure, sure. I never like calling them dead, and I'm not going to call them dead right now because right. I think it's stupid. Right. But how much longer do we have this together in your mind? I think I'm going to say two years. I, I think that. Two years from now, you're going to see Brady finally say, okay, uh, maybe I need to contemplate retirement. He's not anywhere close to done. He was amazing. That was incredible. And then the other thing is Belichick. Belichick, same thing. I think it, I think we're getting towards that part of the story. Now, they're they're not going to fall off the earth this year. Yeah, how do you how, how do you think they Flores, handle Flores, if he's the D coordinator, is going to be phenomenal. An extension of Patricia. They're not going to miss a beat. What about O'Shea? And if O'Shea is going to be the same thing. He's been there forever. Now, let's not forget, McDaniels left the team in 2007 and went to uh, Denver. I was on that team the next year, you yeah. know. So, and Billy O'Brien took over, and right. they were still one of the better teams in football. Right. So, O'Shea is more than qualified. He will be phenomenal. Brian Flores will be phenomenal. And if they bring on Greg Schiano, which I think they want to bring in Schiano because they think the RPO thing is going to become a real thing. And, and he has college so much. and he has college background. Right. But McDaniel's going to the Colts is going to be great. Uh, 
I, I mean, I just think he's he's made for that team at yeah. this time, and they're going to do some good things. So after the game, I'm at this party, and I'm I'm hanging out with all these people, and a lot of Eagles fans are together, and this Vikings fan comes up to me, and I'm wearing my Dawkins jersey, and he's hitting me, and he's super excited, and I realize he's really drunk. And he goes, you got to get rid of Wentz. How are you going to get rid of Foles? You gotta, and I said, Wentz is better than Foles. This is a Vikings fan, and he was so passionate about Foles that he put his hand on my throat. Okay, right. and this th- my friends looked at me like this, and I like I said, you need to stand that down yeah. right now. Right, like you need to calm down. Right, but what I took away from that after I calmed down was. That is the person, and I understand the question, how do you replace Nick Foles? He goes out there, throws three touchdowns, catches a touchdown, outduels Tom Brady, wins the franchise their first quarterback, and now we're sitting here going, we got to trade him because Wentz is coming back. Yeah. I know that Wentz is better. I'm just curious, how do you do it? All right. Well, you know? Everybody's got to pump the fucking brakes. He's a brakes. legend now from now on. Pump Sims. the fucking brakes. He's still, listen. Come on. I just don't. Is everybody got to be like Johnny Media member? Johnny Media the moment. I mean, four weeks ago, we wanted a bench for Nate Sudfield. Now he's fucking up there with Rodgers and Brady. Let's put him in. He's one of the three best of all time just because of one game against one of the worst fucking defenses ever to play in Super Bowl history without one of their best players to add into that. I mean, come on. He's not even in the same fucking planet as Carson Wentz, okay? That's just the way it is. The Eagles were the superior football team. So, Nick Foles, in my mind, still good. Not as good as what everybody thinks. It's somewhere in between the, somewhere in between what we saw at the end of the year and the playoffs. Uh, Carson Wentz is like a once-in-a-generation talent. Uh, there's no denying that. If Carson Wentz is playing, they win the game still. Maybe Carson Wentz doesn't underthrow that ball to, to Alshon Jeffrey down the right sideline that gets bopped, you know, bopped in the air for the interception. Maybe Carson Wentz would have put it right on the money, and it would have been 22 to six, and the game would have been over. But falls, you know. So again, the great quarterback. We got to get into this. Just real quick, what Carson Wentz did for this team was he was so great early and midway through the year, and he he covered holes. He allowed the team to get better in certain areas where they needed to get better. So he won games by himself to then get here to the end of the year where they're really hitting on all cylinders yeah. in all phases, and Nick Foles got to take advantage of that. They were the better team on the field than every game in the playoffs. So, and I, I didn't pick him in the Super Bowl. I know that because I wasn't sure if a Nick Foles could outduel Brady. Certainly, he played amazing. There's yeah. no doubt about that. But to me, you trade Nick Foles because if Carson Wentz comes out what in do you the think first they game, get for Foles, you know, they have him under contract. I know. What can we get? Can we get a first round pick for him? I now? don't know if you can get a first round, but you might be able to get a second round for him. The man just won the Super Bowl. I mean, the Arizona Cardinals, teams like that. Yeah. I mean, wh- whatever happens in Minnesota, Shermer? certainly. New I mean, York? No. could all be. Uh, yeah, I don't think that'll happen. But certainly are all possibilities. You can't keep them in Philadelphia because we have idiot fans, like you just said, fanboy at the party, yeah. who have no clue about football. I mean, five weeks ago, he's going to get benched for Nate Sudfeld. Now he's the greatest quarterback ever. And they can't do it because of Wentz struggles the first game of the year. The Philadelphia fans are going to go, well, we won the Super Bowl. Nick Foles, maybe we should put him in. It's going to divide the locker room. It's going to fuck everything up. I will say this, though. Yes. If you want to follow Foles, you're going to have your whole life to do it. His plans after he retires is to become a pastor. And I don't know about you, but I absolutely will bow down to the church of Nick fucking Foles. <laughs> I will follow him and whatever he preaches from now on. Right. I, I, he is Jeff Hostetler. He gave us what we needed to get. He was better than Jeff Hostetler. And he will be a legend forever. Yes. No one can ever talk crap about Nick Foles in Philadelphia hey, that again. That was his best game of his career. You have a great note that we're going to get okay. to. Uh, by the way, Malcolm Butler, I just got another alert from the BR app, yeah. posted a whole thing on Instagram defending himself good he should this is what he needs to do somebody's got to speak out against new england eventually and tom brady liked the post on instagram yeah good that means a lot in our social media world well, i know it, sh- it doesn't mean a lot well to you. i get it he should that's telling you that they're pissed they go what the fuck we're letting one guy so what did he say what can we can we read it i mean you can't tease me like that and get me all 
hot and bothered. Hot and bothered. Let me pull up the uh, BR app as you completely sidewind. That's everything. okay. Good. Wow. We have to know this information, though. I mean, this is. All right. He said, I want to thank Mr. Kraft, the Kraft family, my coaches, blah, 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 blah. In each of my four years, we have achieved conference championships. Um, they are not. Oh. Uh, during Super Bowl week, I never attended any concert, miss curfew, or participated in any of the ridiculous activities being reported. They are not only false, but hurtful to me and my family. Although I wish I could have contributed to help my team win, I have to get ready for the next opportunity moving forward. I want to apologize to anyone offended by my language reported immediately after the game. I can't wait for the 2018 season to get here. I will be ready. Good for him. He's been disrespected. He shouldn't have played for the Patriots this year anyways. He should have held out. I mean, he's, I mean, not only won them a Super Bowl, he's certainly been one of the best defensive players on their team the last few years, and then they just said, ah, fuck you, we're not going to pay you, but we're going to bring in Stefan Gilmore and give you all this money, so I hope he goes somewhere else. This is one thing I don't like about the Patriots, that they do that. They don't ever talk up their stars. They talk about the guys that they got under contract that they're paying for a bargain for, mm -hmm. but they never talk about the good players on their team because they want to keep their they want to keep their prices low. He wants bargains for players, and because they win, they get away with it, but that's why you see guys like Jamie Collins and some of those guys right. leave town because they go, no, I'm pretty damn good and somebody's going to have to pay me at some point. Let us start off. We are now diving in to Sims's film notebook. He spent all day today watching the film, yeah, figuring thanks, guys. out thanks. what exactly Fuck happened. Yourself, we are you. working Sims to the bone. Holy shit. This is your purpose in life. Yes. We're going to lock you in a room. We're going to strap some nodes to your brain. This is we're like, just going to suck out am all I your in football New England knowledge. all again? That's what they did to me in New England. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, who's wearing the hoodie? <laughs> <laughs> Let us start first. Eagles offense versus Patriots defense. What I have done is I've taken Sims's notebook and I've found about four or five themes about what happened in the game. And one of the themes that you wrote down was the Malcolm Butler butterfly effect. Ripple fall. The yeah, ripples ripple about what happened by taking him out. I'm going to read a, I'm going to read all the ones that you had Go ahead. and then we'll talk about it. Mm -hmm. Your big thesis statement yeah. was the Patriots have to put McCordy and Chung in tough spots with no Butler. You wrote on the first third down, the Patriots double Ertz and Rowe misses a tackle and that would have been Butler. Right. The first touchdown to Ashley, that would have been Butler or Alshon Gilmore. Jeffrey, right. Yeah, not not uh yes. Rowe. Not Rowe. You wrote 37 Richards, right. who's not good right. and has never been good, right. has no chance versus Ertz, and it sounds like there were multiple plays throughout the game, including a big play to Corey Clement. The wheel route down the sideline where he broke down the middle. and That got to all the, happened right. because Richards was there, and it would have been Chung that would have been if Chung. Butler was there. Exactly. And you also wrote, the Patriots played more zone than I remembered, right. and I'm sure that was because Butler was out too. I would think so. All of those things yes. are because Butler is out. It wouldn't right. have just been one. One throw, it was the shifting of everybody. Right. Uh, exactly right. So anybody out there that you're hearing going, it's not that big of a deal, okay? I mean, when you take one of the five best players in your team off the field, it's a big deal. And he was undoubtedly one of the three best players on their defense. How many times have we talked on the podcast all year, right? The pressure they put on Gilmore, McCourty, yes. and Butler is unmatched. They could by put any team eight guys in the box yes. because they had Gilmore, McCourty, and Butler. And then when you go from three to two, you can't put eight guys in the box no, anymore. No, no. And they did. They decided they had to put eight guys in the box because they were so scared of Philadelphia overpowering them right. up front, which they did, that – Yes, they were compromised, and without Butler, that was a huge deal. Nobody puts more pressure on their corners in football than the New England Patriots. They've done that all year, and yes, Malcolm Butler, listen, is he a top 10 corner in football? Probably not, but he's like that next group down. He's somewhere between 10 and 15, or at least 10 and 20 yeah. at no, at the worst, yeah. at the absolute worst. Man, uh, speaking of the dominant offensive line, here are the notes that you wrote down about the Eagles O-line being right. Right. dominant. Pats use a four down front. Lefko would have gotten yards. <laughs> Pats are either using bear or five man front every pay unless it's an obvious pass. Right. The blunt touchdown, which was beautiful, yes. was a complete annihilation of the Patriots front. Front. You did say going for two afterwards was stupid. stupid. And I agree. Yes. And you wrote some of the downhill runs are comical how much the Eagles are dominating the Patriots front five yards downfield. I mean, we said this was a possibility oh and gosh. it was whole game, huh? Whole game. I mean, I mean, I still had a few plays of frustration where I said, man, stop running horizontal, yes, you know, did that Philly, a lot. Philly offense and everything else. But when they ran downhill, I mean, it was, like I said in my notes, annihilation. 
I mean, it was Malcolm Brown and Lawrence Guy and some of the people in the front seven. Trey Flowers is a reason you didn't hear about his name all night, right? Because he had to play basically defensive tackle the whole game. But, I mean, there was plays, Lefko, when they ran the downhill guard pole right up the middle, they were five and six yards down the field before the running backs even absorbed contact yes. because they were getting blown out of the way, whether it was Wisniewski, Kelsey, Brooks, you know, uh, Holly Vali Vati Vaitai. Holly Puli Vati Vaitai. Thank you. He was great in the run game, and so was our man on the right. Uh, right, you know, Lane Johnson. Lane Johnson. Thank you. The Can, big baller supreme. Yes. Uh, so, yes, it was a total ass whooping from that standpoint. It, it, to the fact where I thought they should have been a hair more patient running the ball in a few second downs. I thought Doug Peterson called two bad plays the entire game. Right. That weird in and out from Aguilar that turned into a seven-yard loss. Right. And then the next drive, they kind of threw like another little flare. And I'm like, just just run the ball. No doubt about it. You the, are having right. so much success. The, yeah, you're right. The, Those were the two plays where I went, you're out thinking around, yourself. Exactly right. Exactly right. Unnecessary. That, and then there was one other call that I think I wrote in my notes. Going kind of for the, two? No, the, with two minutes and three seconds left. Oh, yes, and they decide to run the ball when that could have been their pass because it was going a two-minute morning anyway. You throw the yeah. ball there. Yeah. That's where you go for the first down, and the game would have been over. Yes. So that was a bad mismanagement to me. I was yelling like mad at the time. What does Ajayi is conserving his knee for the future mean? I mean, I was I said, I think I wrote concerning, but I probably oh. was, I was writing so fast. Gotcha. His knee is concerning to me. Yes, you could see it. And he was not the same as Corey Clement or LeGarrette Blunt. Now, he still has talent, but you could tell there's one leg there, that leg that's degenerative, and he had to get microfracture surgery on or whatever else. I think I, I was just, pretty spot on midweek saying that Corey Clement could be a feature back hey, in the NFL. Yeah, I think you're right, kid. I think you're right. Yards Way receiving. to go, kid. Way to go. He's got the spark. He does. And he's just, and when he's he comes right downhill, type. exactly right. I mean, he's just a power, explosive guy. In terms of crazy play, right. you did say that on that crazy Alshon interception, on the other side, oh. Aguilar blew by Chung and was wide open. Yes. And and, and, and again, these aren't like. These no, are, you're not going to see it. No. And these are pick em plays. Like, he's got the choice and he. Jeffrey was, of course, he pretty on fire two. at that point, too. Yeah. And he had already caught the touchdown pass. I think Alshon Jeffrey's my favorite wide receiver in Eagles history. Hey, he's fun to watch. That, I love that, that catch size, was incredible. physicality. Yes. And he showed up. But, yes, Chung, again, was stuck in the slot covering an Aguilar, which he shouldn't have had to have yes. done. And, yes, if Foles just decided to go the other way where look right and make the safety go to Jeffrey, he would have came back left and thrown a touchdown pass to Aguilar. But regardless – he still put a ball that was there to be catchable. You just got a bad break there. Yes. And really, you guys were on the verge of really putting the Patriots in a tough spot at that point because you score a touchdown there, you're going to go up 22-6. to six. I think that my pick of Ertz as the X Factor was the guy. It I was. felt in every crucial situation, yep. third and short, fourth and short, he was the guy in the slot. He had the game-winning touchdown. They didn't have anybody for him. No, they tried to double him a few times. They did double him a few times during the game. Uh but also they were compromised in other positions too. And I think they realized that, okay, we can't continue to double him yeah. because of the Butler thing man. to where they had to basically say, okay, Jordan Richards on a third down, you got to take him man yeah. to man. I mean, fuck, Torrey Smith and Nelson Aguilar were unreal. They were. And they, everybody yeah. lived up to their potential. They did. Especially Nick Foles. And that's where we're going to wrap up this side of the ball. Yeah. You wrote in all caps. Foles is doing shit that I have never seen him do. You even wrote later that Patricia called all of the right defenses really in really important times, yep. but Foles just made the throws. Foles made the throws. Best game he's ever played. No doubt. And I mean, after playing the best game he ever played against Minnesota. Right. I mean, the fourth down was a brilliant little blitz scheme up front where he hit Ertz for the two-yard gain on that last drive. And he got out of the way. He, he got out of the way. Out of the pocket. It was a great play by Patricia. He had the right blitz on. It, it, it kind of exposed your... your uh, your protection on that play, even the play before that, which I think was like a screen pass into the flat, and he had to throw it real quick. Again, it was another brilliant play. Again, Patricia coached the game exactly right. He really did. When they dropped into zones, a lot of the times they were all over your guys, but there were some times where Foles just made an amazing throw or Torrey Smith made an amazing yes. contested catch, like on the first Aguilar, drive. Yeah. At all of them. So that standpoint, again, it's just your talent – over outshine their team bottom line is the Patriots they got to get players on the defensive side of the ball this offseason 
they got away when with, you realize they lost Hightower, Jabal Sheard, Rob Ninkovich, Ninkovich. They Chris lost Long, them, and they never really replaced them. They just no, drafted guys. No. You need that mix. Yes, and they need more linebackers. They, 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 they have to redo that. You think about their losses this year. It was all against the same kind of teams. Teams that were big and physical that had enough scheme to kind of screw them over. Right, just enough. You didn't need to like reinvent the wheel. But the Panthers, right? Chiefs, the Chiefs, exactly. And then the Miami Dolphins. They didn't have Gronk that game, but we talked about Miami. He was good up front all year, yeah. and Gase has good concepts. A few other little nuggets just that I wrote down. Yeah. Jake Elliott hitting a clutch 46-yard kick, mm-hmm. just being like an undrafted rookie that they get in the middle of the preseason I thought was incredible. Uh, I'm calling him Big Dick Doug from now on. He should. Two for two on fourth downs. He said after the game, playing conservatively is a good way to go eight and eight. I thought going for that fourth down on their own 40 was the only thing that you had to do. Yes. I didn't like him going for that fourth down that they called Philly special, but boy, was I wrong. Man, the the their advantage of the game was their offense versus their defense. Yes. And as you could see, their defense versus their offense was not an advantage, right? So that's where I, I think you you're had to do really going to like the Philly special. It's a play call that's now already on t-shirts guys are already getting it tattooed on I their saw arms a picture, right uh it was found by the eagles quality control coach press taylor right is that what you used to do in new england yes so this is why i think sims is going to love that play yeah it was found out by someone in the eagles organization that did what you did in new england right and it was taken from the bears in 2016 in the bears it was called clemson special and in that play cameron meredith threw a touchdown to matt barkley Right. You know who drew up that play? Dal Logan. Your friend, yes. Dal Logan. Right. Dal Logan is now down in Miami. Remember, Dal Logan is the guy that draw, drew up that incredible two point conversion earlier this year right. with Trubisky, where they did like a double reverse. Is that throw. the? Yeah, that was the night game against Minnesota. What it was, was that game? Right. It was. Right. It yeah. was the game where Case Keenum came in the second half, and then right. he didn't not play the rest of the year. Right. But Dal Logan's the master of the goal line plays. But what I loved about it. It was a play they've never run. Nick Foles has never caught a pass in his life. Trey Burton in the NFL. Trey Burton has never thrown a pass in the NFL. And Ernie Adams, we know that he can go and find all the plays and he's never going to miss one. He can't find a play that's never been called and no one's ever done anything before. Yeah, that's exactly right. But Dal Logan's getting a play in the in Super, Super Bowl. Bowl. Way to go, Dal. Pretty but, fucking cool. And, yeah, and hey, this the one guy that's not accounted for – in coverage situations, is the quarterback. More times than not, you just not thinking. That's why New England ran it with the p- fake play. Man. And, of course, uh, they did it as well. But Brady dropping that one. Oh, I know. Brady, he, <laughs> he did. He Alligator <laughs> armed it a little bit, and he just he leaped too quickly. If he just kept running, he it was going like, to run right it underneath it. It looked like it. a Madden glitch. Uh, but again. Like it looked like it hit his fingers. It was like, boom. <laughs> and you're like, how does that happen? But again. He's a quarterback. I know. So I'm not going to talk yeah. shit. All right, now we're going to flip it over. Patriots offense, Eagles defense. You're on the field before the game, and you wrote down, because there was a lot of guys that had flu-like symptoms. Yes. You said, Timmy Jernigan is sick. He looks like he lost 10 pounds. This is why Bo Allen is playing so much. Exactly right. Timmy Jernigan. I didn't know why I saw Bo Allen so much, and this made sense. He was no, he was no factor. We knew he was. Timmy Jernigan was sick early in the week. I saw him on the field pregame, and I said, man, there's no way Timmy Jernigan's like 303 pounds, which I believe he's listed at on the roster right now. Yeah. He looked light. And I'm an expert in looking at naked men, okay? So I know <laughs> that, yes. Um, but, yes, he's listed at 295, sorry. And I can promise you he wasn't 295. He looked thin to me. And then when I turned on the film, I thought the same thing. His ass and legs looked two, three sizes smaller than usual. Man. And, and of course, I'm probably he was fatigued, too, from not being healthy. So, yeah, that was a big part of the game. Uh, one guy you missed. So – uh, I'm watching the game, and I'm sitting there, and I texted you during the game. You said, look, the Eagles are playing way too much one safety. They need to play more two. I'm talking to all the Patriots fans in my section going, why are we playing this much man-to-man? This side of the ball went just like we said, too. Yeah. It was crossers across. It was fake and out. And let me just read what Sims wrote about coaching. We're going to start off with this <laughs> sentence. McDaniels is owning Schwartz. Yes. Here are the other things you wrote. Eagles defense is too simple with no disguise. Eagles have way too many five-man pressures, yes. which Sims and Lefko, it's going to go in the Constitution. We hate five-man pressures. Right. You wrote, Eagles are biting on run fakes like the Patriots are the 92 Cowboys. What the fuck? Stupid. And you ended with this. The first read is open every play. The Eagles are talking to each other when the ball snaps on tempo plays. Right. 
literally the worst thing possible, but it just sounds like Schwartz came out there with a game plan that makes no sense. Just too aggressive for me. Like he thought that we could just get in their face and we can just beat them man to man. No, you can't. Not with this team. Their scheme is just too good. They find ways to – the only reason they settled for field goals early in the game was because your pressure got there, okay? You know, you guys were still fresh. You pushed the pocket. Brady couldn't step into throws. He threw some wobblers. And and that was really the only thing that saved you in a lot of crucial situations. How did you think McDaniels came out to attack? What was his focus? I, I, I think to his focus was, ooh, that's a good word, just how he came out to attack. Yeah, what was his intention? Yeah, early on, you know, um, oh, that's a good question by well, you. Well, you wrote in the yes. second half. The second half they came the, out. You said the yes. Patriots' second half game plan right. was seams, right. play actions, right. and screens. And you said even Gronk's touchdown the start of the second half was a great tendency breaker. Great tendency breaker. So they came and Bill Belichick and, and McDaniels did their adjustments. Right. And in the first half, listen, I don't, I, I, I'd have to rethink that. The first half, listen, th there was stuff there. It was open. They were aggressive. They were moving the ball. Like I said, the pass plays. rush just affected them. Yeah. Right. Uh, he drops the pass on third down. Brady, that been fourth huge. down. They come back. He's got the scheme open to his left, but he liked the Gronkowski matchup. He doesn't even get to throw a real ball to Gronkowski because uh, Brandon Graham came in and kind of hit his arm yeah. just as he was throwing up his bad ball. But I think what I, basically my point was in the second half, they, they I know the Patriots, they go in at halftime and they go, OK, this is how they're playing us. We, we know. And so what did they say? How so are they playing? Them? They're, they're, they're going to go. Well, they're playing a lot of single safety defenses to all formation. We're getting man. We're getting cover three. We're getting weak side cover three. That's really what we're doing. And that's why what did we see the first play? That, and they said, we're not sure if we can block them. So what they did is we, we're going to run some play actions. The first play of the second half. You yeah. Remember what it was? Seam route that he missed to Rob Gronkowski wide open. They realized, okay, Brady, uh, we're going to not only be able to do play action to suck up the the uh, linebackers, but within the single safety, Brady's so good, smart, you know, look him off, manipulate him yes. a little with your eyes, come back to the seam the other side. That was the same type of play where we saw in the Hogan touchdown right. because he looked to Gronk left. He did. Jenkins went left, and then he came back and threw basically just a lollipop lob to Hogan who was wide open going up the seam. It really was a slow death as an Eagles fan. Yeah, and they were just, smart. They couldn't stop him. They were smart. They could not stop him. The play actions and the screens at least slowed down your pass rush right. and gave them a chance and that was phenomenal from that standpoint you could tell that sims noticed that the eagles defensive line was the saviors you wrote the eagles d line saved the team in this many ways first quarter people open every play multiple guys actually every play right the good thing is brady can't follow through because they're right in his face right. and that's saving them right you wrote man darby stupid on that post wheel but cox saved a touchdown by moving brady in the pocket yeah, exactly there's right. one example right. another one brandon graham dominated Shaq mason in the fourth quarter. Right. Dominated. Dominated. You wrote on the Graham forced fumble. White was open in the flat for 10 yards. And you wrote, I feel bad for Brady. Yeah. I, I, I just felt bad. I think he played awesome. Now, again, you know. But how great was Brandon Graham? Brandon Graham was amazing. I mean. Was he the most impressive guy? Brandon Graham and Fletcher Cox were better on film than I remembered watching yeah, the game on I TV. Had, I had Eagles fans going, where is Fletcher Cox? Oh, no, no. He was there. He was we there. We measured yeah. defensive linemen in sacks. And, I know. But they were really just getting pressure all the time. All Brady the was just so fluid. So fluid. Was new. You know, in the second half, he had urgency to know, I can't wait for the second guy sometimes. I can't wait for the third guy. I just got to get the ball in my hand because these guys might ruin the game. Game. Um, I felt bad from Brady like this because, first of all, it bothers me that people don't think I like Tom Brady. It really does. It fucking bothers me. And, of course, I got a full week of it in the Super Bowl. Oh, you don't like Tom Brady. Just because I think Aaron Rodgers is the greatest of all time. People, You're not allowed to say that. But we are still watched greatness in that football game. And in a lot of ways, it, I mean, he took a lot of big hits at the age of 40. 28 completions for 505. Again, this is like opposite Tom Brady from 2011, 2012, who would have had like 48 completions for 505 yards. If he, but now, because he can throw the ball down the field so well, he's unbelievable. It was but just to, to stand in the pocket, some of the anticipation, the throws, and 
again, this is not taking credit against Tom Brady. A lot but of guys are wide open. The game plan was phenomenal. Yeah. The first guy he looked at a lot of the times was wide open. He just got the ball. He looked at him. He was, okay, can I have a path or somewhere to throw the ball? And he threw it perfect, and, and that was all there was you to it. You even said on the last drive right. where I'm sitting there going, dear God, right. the Patriots are going to make this comeback. You said there was an out and up. An up and out to Hogan that was wide open. What the fuck is Mills doing? But Cox and Graham save it. And on that last drive, they got pressure up the middle every single play. Every single play. It was Graham over Shaq Mason or Fletcher Cox coming through or Chris Long around the edge. But Brady was amazing moving in the pocket or getting the ball out of his hand. I mean, even the fourth down when they were backed up. Right, the fourth down, they're backed up. He hits the in cut to Amendola, diving right to continue yeah. the drive. I mean, uh, again, it was a great. He had somebody in his face, and he's about to get plowed from the outside, and he knew it, and he had to throw a ball in the in cut. He threw it low in a safe place, and it was a great job. Sorry, Brandon God. Cooks, would they have thrown for six hundred yards if he was able to play? Yeah, I don't know if it really would have mattered much because yeah, everybody it was, was open. <laughs> exactly right. Um, <laughs> I, this is how incredible the Patriots are. Yes, this is what I realized during the game. Right, the Eagles are up. Eight points, and if the Patriots would have scored there, I think the Eagles would have lost. But this is how crazy the Patriots are. Yeah. With two minutes and nine seconds left, Barnett has the ball in his hands on the Patriots 31 up five, and the Patriots are still not dead. It is fourth and ten. New England on their own nine with 42 seconds left and no timeouts. Brady is nearly sacked. Right. And the Patriots are still going to get a chance at their own 49 with nine seconds left to send the game to overtime. They never die. They never die. No, they maximize yeah. the game mm-hmm. at all. I'm talking about he has two guys' hands on him on the end line with 49 seconds left and no timeout on fourth down, 22-yard pass, and we're still alive. Yeah. He never dies. No, he never dies. It's incredible. It, the self. The, I was telling Patriots fans. Right. I was going, you're going to fucking tie this game. I go, why are you doubting him? And he hit it. And they looked at me and I went, I'm going to stop saying that because I'm giving him life. The self like, belief. It's incredible. The sixth sense, you know, just the clutch factor. It just, it's all just, it's through, it's through the roof. It's, it's unbelievable. And then, yes, their ability to execute in situational football and build a handle every situation, right? That's why I was mad at Doug Peterson, yes. like you said, with two minutes and three seconds left. Throw the ball. You got to throw the ball and get the first down and win the game right anyway. there because yeah. you can't let Brady and them have the ball again. I also want to say, I think it is wonderfully apropos that the biggest play defensively of the game, Brandon Graham and Derek Barnett. Yeah. Brandon Graham was someone that, again, if you don't know Eagles lore, when that draft happened, Adam Schefter stood there like Mr. Reporter and said, Earl Thomas is still on the clock, and this was unexpected, and the Eagles will definitely take Earl Thomas. And they took Brandon Graham. Right. And Earl Thomas went out there to Seattle, and he's become an incredible player. Yeah. But with Brandon Graham's longevity, he's closing that gap. And I think it was incredible for him to win because he was seen as an underachiever bust for so long. Right. And it was personal for me with Derek Barnett right. because I came out and I called him a fat pass rusher. And people say, oh, you can't talk about draft picks anymore. Brandon, I didn't realize that Derek Barnett was exactly the guy they needed from this point of view. I thought there were other defensive linemen and players that had higher potential because no one thought, at least I didn't, that the Eagles were ready for a Super Bowl run this year. I was looking long term. But what they needed was the guy that could make impactful plays in year one and have a really good eight to ten year career. Maybe not lead the league in sacks, but they needed that piece now. And Derek Barnett was the most polished guy that's what we always said he's maybe maximized his talent it's a very good talent right but maybe it's not a high as ceiling as the other guys right but they needed him now they needed him and now. when you win a super bowl that's really all that matters that exactly so right. i'm super happy to eat crow about Derek barnett howie roseman constructed this team perfectly yes he did the free agents that he brought in the guys that he re-signed yep. it all worked to a beautiful point and that's when they win the super bowl yes thought it was and you know what i agree with brady the Eagles defense made one good play at the right time. They did. Pretty much. And you know what? A lot of Eagles fans are like, oh, I can't believe you said that. Hey, man, that means we won on one good play. Right. That's how good our offense was, that we won with one good defensive New play. New England had to go get done with the game 
And I, I got to think, this is Bill Belichick, one of the great defensive minds in the history of the sport. I mean, of course, the greatest mind ever in any aspect of the game in the history of the sport. It's not even close. But the Patriots had to get done in the game. This is Belichick. I'm just saying this because it's the Parcells coaching tree. This is, you know, 80 Giants football, even early 2000 Patriots. It's it's defense. It's physicality. It's control the game that way. You heard Brady after the game say, we never really played the game on our terms. No, they didn't because they were chasing. They the were game. always at a chase, and they always had to change what they wanted to do right. because the Eagles were the physically superior football team. But the Patriots still, and especially Josh McDaniels, they must have got done with this game and gone, wait, we scored 33 points and had 610 yards, and our quarterback threw for 500 yards and three touchdowns and no interceptions, and we lost? <sighs> That has to be like one of the biggest alarms in the history of the Patriots organization to say, we need more players. Like I ter- I've said that last pictures to you. I wrote Jimmy's and the Joes beat the X's and the O's barely, barely, barely. I mean, and that was the least talented Patriots team I think we've ever seen in the least, Super Bowl. Least talented than 2011? I, I think so. Yeah. I do. I think that I'll team had a it. few more. St- it doesn't matter because I'll it's not about you. that. It's just about. They're, they're they're like a fucking mythical exactly. creature. They're the unicorns. They're the Loch Ness monster. It's it's not easy. Their belief because of Belichick and Brady and of course McDaniel's and Patricia. They're hard to conquer. Yeah, they are. And you did it with a backup quarterback. I'm ready. Can I do my thing now? Okay. Shit. Here okay. we go. Hold on. Can I? I want to film it. Right, well, it's going to uh, be like a oh, little, we got a camera. It's, it's going to be like ten minutes. Zoom in, zoom in. Um, all right, so I'm going to try and do this, and uh, it's all of that. It's yeah, it's a good. Holy amount. shit! Well, here's the deal. I got done the game, and I had like a hundred text messages. I had like thousands of tweets and stuff. Right. Like I, it was just really crazy, and it was interesting because all week. We were being really professional. Yeah. Every time I talked about the game, it was X's and O's. I was editing the podcast with Josh. I was posting online. If I did have free time, I maybe went out and like had a good time. And it really didn't hit me that the Eagles were in the Super Bowl like emotionally until Saturday night. Right. So my parents came in Thursday. Right. And but Saturday was the first night where I actually like spent time with them. Yeah. And what's funny is is. You are your parents, even if you don't want to admit it. Yep. Like you with your dad, you're starting to realize you say the same shit. Right. And who raised you determines who you are. Right. Well, I realize that my mom is the kind of person that when you're in an elevator and it's packed and the door opens and someone's there, right before it closed, she goes, go Eagles! We're out to dinner and we overhear a waitress talking to a table of Patriots fans going, Patriots, good. Eagles stink. My mom overhears it and she goes, excuse me? Are you fucking kidding me? Like, my mom is picking fights with waitresses. She's going to deny it. Mom, I, I was there. I watched it happen. My dad is the guy that goes up to random people and goes, just so you know. You want to hold that E a long time to get a better better Eagles cheer so more people can come on. My dad apparently got into dozens of altercations during the game that our friend Ron told me, wearing a beautiful Bill Berge jersey. That's who I was raised by. Yes. Now, I'm a little different. I was in a section with a good amount of Patriots fans, and I actually befriended all of them before the game. I said good game. It made for a great environment because no matter what was going on, we're shooting the shit with each other. We're both just talking about how nervous we are. It was, the whole section, it was a good time. Right. My mom's sitting there going, God, you hear me saying go Patriots. I'm like, Mom, just chill out. Like We're going to enjoy this game. And I didn't. it's not just because I'm not like them. I think it's also because I've watched it for so long and I know how this story ends. Right. And I didn't want to get into this super mindset because of fear and doubt. Because when you're an Eagles fan, it always creeps back in. Right. But that's what was so crazy about this season is there was no moment the whole year right. where you go, this is a fraud. Right. There was no moment where it's fear and doubt. When Carson went down, believe me, it shook me. Yeah. But there was no fear and doubt about what the team was. Right. Yeah, we just didn't know if they could overcome it, but we knew what they were. I didn't feel it until 9-22 in the fourth quarter. 33-32? When Gronk scored the touchdown. Right. When Gronk scored the touchdown, that fear and doubt came in. Yeah. I'm talking about Rondé Barber. Yeah. I'm talking about Joe Juravicious. Right. 
I'm talking about Ricky Manning Jr., three interceptions. I'm talking Mike Vick, interception to Green Bay. I'm talking Rodney Harrison. Like, all of those things came up because I went, Nick Foles is going to have to drive 75 yards, and there's nine minutes left. Brady's going to get the ball back. And it was it was overwhelming. And then you get to third and six. Right. And that was the Ertz first down. Right. And when they got that, something happened to me as a Philadelphia fan that's never happened before. Right. All of that doubt left, and I got really confident. Right. And right when that happened, I yelled, Foles, eat the whole fucking clock. And I felt all of my fear and doubt go into all of the Patriots fans. Right. Because they were sitting there going, man, you guys have been able to do whatever you want to us. And right. they weren't used to that. Right. 41 points against the Patriots. Right. It was crazy. Right. And I felt all of that leave me and go to them. And when that clock hit zero. Right. And the confetti is falling. Right. I want to say this to every fan that hasn't won. It was a calm and it was like a buzz but you're still waiting for them to take it away from you. Right. I'm waiting for a challenge. I'm waiting for for a ruling. I'm waiting for anyone to— It was a delayed—I re- don't even mean to cut you no, off. No, please. I'm just trying to put myself to verify what you said. It was a delayed reaction by the Eagles fans. It really was. Even the team. I think they were all like, wait, it's 0-0, zero, zero, but are we allowed to run on the field? Go ahead. Sorry. No, no. I mean, I'm talking, I sat there for a while, and every word and every speech, it wasn't like, it wasn't like, yay, I'm so happy. It's like, oh, they're going to interview Nick Foles? That definitely means we didn't lose. You know what I mean? Oh, they're going to give it to Carson Wentz? Oh, if they're going to let him lift the trophy, we definitely won. Like, I still wasn't ready. It still didn't hit me yet. And I go down to the bottom of my row, and my dad and Ron come up, and they hanging out with me and my mom, and they're doing a huge eagle shit. It's the it's the the christening one. It's the fly, and they're doing the whole song. Right. And I'm sitting down there, and I'm I'm getting a video, and I put my arm around my dad, and I'm ready to do the E A G L E S, and he's looking at his phone. And I'm like, you fucking millennial. Like, what are you doing? Like, can you be a part of this? Uh, And I realize that he's texting his family. Right. Fuck. Yep. Let it go. We won this for dad. Right. Because. Fuck. It's okay, dude. So my grandfather on his deathbed. Right. Was cheering so loud for the Eagles that the nurses ran because they thought he was having a heart attack. Right. So this shit is in the blood. It is. And so what's crazy to me is, is fanhood is stupid, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't make sense. It's irrational. And in this profession, it's borderline fireable. Right. Right? Like, you need to be super professional and wear your tie. And you work your whole fucking life to hopefully cover your team in the Super Bowl. And then you sit in the press box and they say no cheering. Right. You're not allowed to. Right. And so for me... To be able to to access this and to not become this like professional bloviator that can have an opinion at the drop of a hat but not share an emotion, like I didn't realize it. Yeah. I didn't realize it until the next day. Like that whole night, I was having a great time and all that stuff. But that next day, I'm in an Uber and I'm with this guy named Jonah who works at Target, and he's just a happy Minnesota dude, man. Right. And I get in the car, and he goes, oh, did you get a chance to go to the game? And I said, yeah, it was, it was crazy. I was working. He goes, you got paid to go to the game? I said, yeah. And he goes, oh, who's your team? And I said, I'm actually an Eagles fan. He goes, you got paid to go to the game and cover your favorite team? I right. went, yeah. And he went, oh, I'm sure your family at home is thrilled. I said, no, I, I got my mom a ticket. And I got my dad a hotel room. Right. And I know my brother Jason's at home going ape shit right now. And I wish he was there. But like, I began to realize that like 14 year old Adam, high school Adam, right. being like, man, if the Eagles ever get back, like, I put them up. They won against the same fucking team. Right. And that was, I cried in the fucking Uber. Yeah. I have cried seven times since that Uber ride. Right. And everything. It's your culture. It's I walk part of in your the apartment being. and my girlfriend has balloons and congratulations up. And I'm like, dang, like, right. and I'm telling you, man, 
It's really because, and I want to say this to everybody, especially people that want to get in this business, never sacrifice your fanhood to be better. Mm -hmm. We're at a time now where you can share it, like embrace it. Like this is the reason you get into this stuff. And it really did shake me to my core. Yep. And man, I'm just going to say too, that it's sweeter because of the team and because of what they went through and the trials and tribulations. Right. And after the game, I'm watching Jason Kelsey, and he's crying. And he says, you know, there's this Calvin Coolidge quote that he has. And I don't want I don't want to say it now, but that's what we believed in. And and he said, I just don't want to say it now because it's going to be too long. And I looked up the Calvin Coolidge quote, and I think it's amazing. Mm -hmm. So Calvin Coolidge was the 30th president in our country. It's funny. He was born in New England, Vermont to be exact. Right. But the quote is this. Nothing in this world can take the place of persistence. Talent will not. Nothing is more common than unsuccessful men with talent. Genius will not. Unrewarded genius is almost a proverb. Education will not. The word is full of educated derelicts. Mm -hmm. Persistence and determination alone are omnipotent. The slogan, press on, has solved and always will solve the problems of the human race. Super Bowl 52 for me is Philadelphia freedom. Mm -hmm. It's freedom from the ring jokes. Right. It's freedom from the scores. We are finally free from what I felt on that, that third down, that fear and that doubt. Sure. And it all went away. And I also find it very interesting that Coolidge is the only president that was born on July 4th, hmm. Independence Day. Hmm. And for me, February 4th, will always be Independence Day for Eagles fans. Yeah. That is the day where all of that shit is gone. Yep. It's over. Right. And I just want to say that if anybody's got anything negative to say or if you're going to call me a fanboy for all this, I'm going to have the same response for you that I'm going to have for everybody. Well, who? I'm sorry. I can't hear you. The sound of the Eagles Super Bowl win is ringing in my goddamn ears. Don't even worry. Just your Oh, no, no, no. Yeah. I ain't got no worries. You want to bump into me on the train? It's all good. Eagles won the Super Bowl. You got something to say to me? Oh, I'm sorry. That's cool. Eagles won the Super Bowl. I watched my boys cry on, on Instagram. I shared a moment with my parents. And I'm just going to tell you, Eagles won the Super Bowl. Yeah. Damn. Yeah. And it's okay. It was amazing, man. Good for you. That was a good speech. Uh, I'm also going to finish with this. I never know your upper lip could get so big when you cry like that. That's was amazing. <laughs> you motherfucker. <laughs> R.I.P. the mush. Yes. He's officially dead. He is dead. In terms of our picks, right. I finished the season up $1,010. <laughs> so if you bet with me all season, <laughs> right. what do you know? Bam. You made $1,000. Uh, you finished um, negative three thousand, negative seven thousand four hundred and twenty. Damn! And I beat you by four games. Gosh! So the mush is dead. No longer Man. negative seven thousand. Negative seven thousand. I also want to give credit to That's one person. Such a record. Before week seven, I came on here and my friend Neil said, "This is the team of destiny. We're going all the way." Right. And you said, "Fuck you, Neil." <laughs> that was October twentieth. <20th. laughs> Neil was right, and I'm going to go in that parade hey, with Neil. But Neil, fuck you still. Just fuck so you, you still. know. Uh, the from odds a, from a giant fan. The <laughs> odds came out for next year. Yeah. Patriots are five to one to win it all. Yeah. Eagles are nine to one. Packers are nine to one. The line that looked juiciest to me, Jaguars are twenty eight to one. I twenty to one. I thought. I I, I saw twenty eight to one. Either way, I agree. I, I'm, I'm just I saying. Saw it, it was grab them now before they get a quarterback. Right. Right. And put some money on the Jaguars. Right. That's the team that makes the most sense. Unless to me. they still have Blake Bortles that and ask then for that money. Take back. that ticket right back. <laughs> you don't want that. Um, damn. So the, you watch the game. Hey, dude. I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna I go almost watch cried it on TV. during the game. I mean, I, I, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a crier, anyways. Like, my kids make fun of me. I mean, I, I, I cry when, like, you know, old Yeller dies. And I cried, like, when Remember the Titans. Like, I cry in Rudy uh, when I'm, they're putting the jerseys. And it's like, oh, dude. I cry doing, in yeah. Armageddon when they go, man. Can I have the honor of shaking the, the hand of the daughter, daughter of the bravest father Fa I've yeah. ever met, or whatever it was? I mean, yeah, I'm a I'm a wuss when it comes to that. Yeah. So don't don't you don't have to. Oh, I'm not worried about yeah. it at all. If you can't access your emotions and you're not here for it, that's my thing. Is 
everyone thinks football is going to be about bragging rights and stuff. Man, we're all connected through family somehow, and that's the reason I, I, I enjoy this. I enjoy breaking it down with you, but yep. uh, you breaking down the game is always special. It was fun to work another season with you. Yep. Uh, I thought we kicked Radio Row's ass. We did. So much so that in the next few weeks, you guys are going to have awesome interviews to Championship. watch. Championship. Championship. G-A-T-L-E-S Eagles. Now you're taking some time off. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we're going to do the podcast next week, right? Yeah, yeah, but Sims has literally worked. I think you've been on camera more than anybody else. I'm I, I, you, Just because you you're doing me, stuff with us right. and NBC. When you texted me that yesterday, I was like, you know what? I think you might be right. I might have been on camera more than yeah, anybody I think else. So. Yeah, so yeah, you're going to get a break. Tired. But we're going we're gonna to make sure that we bring in uh, the really good interviews to keep you guys entertained. Uh, as always, follow us on social at Sims and Lefko. I am going to be reading all of the comments. Uh, iTunes and stuff. We'll work them in the next few weeks. We just had to do a big recap How about today. the end? NFC East. Okay, it's, I thought that was fitting too, because I think it's always been the greatest division. But the NFC East, the first division to have all their teams win the Super Bowl. See that game? It's old school Giants, football. Baby. That's why they do it the old school way. Giants, Eagles, Cowboys of Washington. Yes. We can unite in that. Yes. Uh, and I also want to say, when the draft is in Dallas, right? And with the 32nd oh, pick, shit. the world <laughs> champion. Philadelphia Eagles. Uh, We're going to take that place over, too. And I'm definitely going to Canton in August that's for Brian gonna be Dawkins. Great. It's going to be awesome. For Sims. Peace out, homies. Cedric would say good night, everybody. Good evening. And the L-E-F-K-O-E. Eagles, left go. Says good night. Love you guys so much. We will holler at you soon. Keep tuning in. We'll keep putting out dope shit. Love you guys. Go, birds.